If you have spent any time looking at theories in the Hunkai Star Rail fandom, you have undoubtedly come across the popular fan theory that Bai Lu is a reincarnated Bai Hung, likely reborn during the sedition in Dan Feng and Ying Xing's desperate attempts to resurrect their friend that heroically sacrificed herself in the battle against Xu Hu. I am here to say that I disagree with that theory. Now, don't get me wrong, I can understand exactly why everyone believes Bai Lu is Bai Hung, especially when you have in-game characters like Jing Liao pushing that narrative, but I'm here to present all the reasons why I think it's simply not the case. Instead, I believe this is a conspiracy organised by a certain faction of Vidyardo preceptors cooperating with Sanctus Medicus to more or less disguise the fact that they're experimenting on the Arbor. There's a lot of in-game material to cover that I'll be going over in detail, so I'll be splitting this into two different videos. In this video, I'll be introducing the Bloomborn Scion, explaining long life biology, explaining Mara, and covering all of the experiments performed by Sanctus Medicus in their quest to create the miracle of Bai Lu, their artificial High Elder. Upon her defeat, Dan Chu drops a document called the Undestroyed Letters. These are letters documenting her correspondence with a Vidyardo named Gochen, who claims to be Dan Chu's obedient servant and who is suspected to be a preceptor by a judge of the Ten Lords Commission. Unfortunately, it seems most people probably didn't read these documents, but for those that did, it reveals some very interesting information. The truth that Bai Lu is an experiment known as the Bloomborn Scion, or rather, a hundred flowers scion in Xi'an. She identifies the subject as Bai Lu by describing a Vidyadara girl with political weight, a lot of skill, a rebellious personality, servants to watch her every move, and who was under the supervision of Tanju's predecessor, she then tells Gochen that, back then, we unintentionally created the miracle of Bloomborn Scion, but there is a limit to mere luck. Until I make further progress in my research, such a miracle is unlikely to occur again. Though we only find two of these letters in this document, there is likely more due to this line in Sanctus Medicus Devil's criminal evidence records, which reads, My assistants and I have thoroughly examined all administrative documents of the Alchemy Commission spanning the past 70 years. The records of Danshu's inhumane experiments and her correspondence with suspected Vidyardo preceptors indicate that this incident was not an impulsive rebellion by individuals masquerading in the name of an ancient cult, as it may seem, but rather a meticulously organised conspiracy. Keep in mind that before the Third Abundance War 30 years ago, Danshu was loyal to Lan the Hunt, so all of her abundance-based experimentation and, by extension, these interactions with Gochen could only have happened within the last 30 years since she became a disciple of Sanctus Medicus. You can read about her backstory in Dan Shu's diary and the Longevous Disciples relic set. In the first letter, Gochen told Dan Shu about how there is some battle, presumably in the scale gorge among the Vidyadara. He said he had no choice but to send that young girl to the Alchemy Commission. He mentioned that she is young and not chosen by selection, but possessed remarkable potential, and that placing her under Don Chu's tutelage would facilitate careful observation and documentation of her growth. He told her that the present times are perilous, and that the scepter of power had fallen aside, and that, although possessing the talent to change the tide, the opportunity to do so was not present. With his letter, he sends a servant to deliver ten samples for her experimentation. The last bit of the letter confirms the recipient is in fact Dan Shu and not her predecessor because they tell her that the method of communication via letters is inconvenient for her and she may need someone to read them aloud, which is because Dan Shu is blind and cannot read them herself. In a later presumably undelivered reply to Gochen, she said she has received the samples but after transplanting and cultivating them, they all turned to powder. It was likely that they were constrained by the waters of the ancient sea, causing them to lose their vitality upon separation from their original body. After all, both the samples and the ancient waters are mystical celestial traces and are elusive to comprehension. These samples should be branches of the arbor, as we have multiple recordings of preceptors ordering for arbor branches to be collected and sent to the Alchemy Commission. Don Chu talks a bit about her dealings with Fantilia and the Stellaron, referred to as a seed here, then clearly identifies the subject as Bai Lu by saying, as for the girl, she has learned quite well under the supervision of my predecessor, but she lacks sufficient experience and tends to be overly rebellious. The servant you sent must watch her every move. There is no need to worry, as she is not likely to break free from our control in the foreseeable future. She then tells Gochen not to send any more samples. This document is damning evidence that Bailu was created by the combined efforts of the Vidyardo preceptors and the disciples of Sanctus Medicus in the Alchemy Commission, and not by Dan Fang, as the Alchemy Commission claimed that she was. They even admitted that she was not chosen by selection in the previous letter. 
In the first letter, Gochun first brings up what seems to be a civil war among the Vidyadara, which is the reason that he has to hand Bai Lu over to Dan Shu. He mentions that the Scepter of Power is fallen aside. This is likely because, in the Preceptor Assembly Chronicle following the execution of Dan Feng, it is said that the Preceptor Council is a stopgap measure for when the High Elder position is vacant or governance is untenable. This means that, without a rightful functioning High Elder, the Preceptors would have been acting as a council up until the creation of Bailu by some of the Preceptors who were working with Sanctus Medicus. Once she existed as a High Elder, the council would have no longer been effective, thus throwing the Vidyada into a war with each other, likely torn between those who want to keep the council set up, those who want to instate Bailu as the High Elder, and those that are still loyal to Dan Feng, undoubtedly made all the worse by Dan Feng's exile by Jing Yuan, which was approved by the Ten Lords Commission. Gochen mentions criminals exiled and knowledge lost. The exile is most likely referring to Dan Hung's exile, and the knowledge should be that of the secrets of the transmutation arcanum, as well as the High Elder's ability to dream of the High Elder knowledge, since, according to Yun Yo in Bai Lu's story 4, should happen after the High Elder receives the Orb of Abyssum and the transmutation arcanum. This is the same knowledge of the transmutation arcanum that the preceptors were brutally interrogating Dan Feng for, and that he never gave to them. Yunyo hypothesized that Bai Lu never experienced these prophetic dreams because either her dragon heart was somehow damaged or the transmutation arcanum was never carried through in full. She, as a lower ranking member of the Vidyada, was likely not aware that the preceptors never got the secrets of the transmutation arcanum and that Bai Lu was, in actuality, the product of an experiment. And now I want to spend some time explaining the biology of a long life species by piecing together various readables and the results of experimentations conducted by a few different characters. According to the key tenets of long life, there are 26 physiological characteristics supported by anatomical and genetic evidence. There are two notable things about the Xianzhou long life human that we know of. One is that their bodies will always try to return to their original state. This was actually the motivation for Dan Shu to join the Alchemy Commission. She was born without an arm and totally blind. Her natural disability put her into the category of incomplete one aboard the Xianzhou, basically a long life species born with physical disabilities that cannot be cured. Interestingly, this also extends to things like wisdom teeth. Long life species are forced to endure their wisdom teeth for their entire life as they're unable to permanently remove them. Dan Shu was able to attach a prosthetic limb to replace her missing arm, but she couldn't find a way to make a prosthetic attachment for her eye that allowed her to see, despite many attempts. In the end, she wanted to see her best friend Yu Fei so badly that she requested an eye transplant so that she could see Yu Fei just once, understanding that it would be a temporary thing and cause her unimaginable pain, which had caused other people to become Marastruck previously. This eye transplant lasted about 10 days before her body rejected the eyes. She screamed in a puddle of her blood and once again returned to the darkness. It was Yufei's death as collateral to Lan's arrow wiping out abundance denizens in the Third Abundance War that caused Dan Shu to turn against Lan and become a disciple of Sanctus Medicus. Sanctus Medicus is, of course, one of Yaosha's titles. Dan Shu, in Pharmacological Studies on the Draft of Draconic Surge, actually tells us a bit about how this works. She tells us that longevity is usually an indicator of cancer, which is cells proliferating beyond their designated lifespan and order becoming immortal and eating away at the host's body until both perish. The immortal body, including Foxians, avoids this by maintaining an internal equilibrium where the cells can shift between differentiated cells and stem cells, obeying specific rules but never creating a single error. This is something that is set in stone at birth and the reason that the immortal body will always return to its natural state. At some point, the original standard will be overwritten and the body will start to develop catastrophically, turning a civilized human into a mindless abomination. This is what is referred to as Marastruck. Understand that Dan Shu is the pinnacle of modern science on the Xianzhou Lofu, especially in the research of Mara and immortality. It's a common misunderstanding among the citizens of the Law Fu that Mara is caused by an issue with memory, but this simply isn't accurate. Mara causes memory issues and not the other way around. This is supported again by Fu Xuan's explanation that Mara is related to an emotional threshold and is not caused by memories, but that it's easier to regard it as a memory issue. She also tells us that short lives are immune to Mara, obviously because they do not have the blessing of Yaoshu, she also implies Vidyado can gain Mara but do not because of their rebirth process, but we have no evidence for or against this idea. 
Also note that Foxians usually die around the age of 300 years old, making Mara a rare condition for them. This is because, according to Todd, their body stops producing the pluripotent stem cells at around 300 years old, which results in multiple organ failure and a quick death within a few days. It's unclear why this happens to them, but one thing of interest is that removing the liver of a Borison results in the Borison turning into an aggressive, cancerous mass within a few hours. This likely describes them becoming Mara-struck. This does not happen if you remove the liver of a Foxian, instead a Foxian will simply regrow a new liver. One thing to note is that Dan Shu tells us that Foxians of Yao Qing are genetically very similar to the Borison, and suggests that the difference between a Xianzhu citizen and an abomination of Yao Shu is merely a cultural one. This brings us to the next top secret information about immortals. Scripture of Yellow Noma Young Essence tells us how disciples of Sanctus Medicus believe that the Xianzhu native's bodies possess circulator vessels in the branching form of the ambrosial arbor. This circuitry system leads towards an organ known as the core S and is critical in the pursuit of true immortality, known as ascension or the second evolution. Dan Shu did manage to achieve this in her ascended form, becoming a mini boss, but I won't delve too deep into that. Anyway, Todd was also investigating the remains of the Mars drug and discovered that the plants attached to them are not actually in a biological category, but are a kind of bionic material. This is very interesting because the investigations of ancient pattern rubbings from the Lofu reveal that it's likely that the secret spell sealing the arbor is just classified as advanced Vidyardo technology and not magic. Putting this information together paints a clearer picture of how Mara works. Inside the body of those who have been blessed by Yaosha is a seed referred to as the Core S. When these bodies experience an imbalance of immortal cells, they become a Mara struck. This also usually happens alongside the core S blooming, causing bionic plant-shaped material to burst out of them. Bai Lu's meeting with Jing Liu tells us that there is a dark current pulsing between her veins and her core S, which is likely preventing her core S from blooming, which theoretically allows her to retain most of her sanity. That, on top of the fact that she felt her core S boiling twice before acquiring her ice sword powers, indicates to me that it is the core S starting to bloom that triggers the cells to become unbalanced, and that some Mara inducing things, such as Shuhu and the revived planet Rahu, invoke Mara by bursting the core S. These core S seeds were likely acquired from the immortal fruits of the arbor, with Foxians supposedly gaining theirs from the dew of another tree, the same tree as the Borison, and the wing weavers most likely gaining theirs from Muldrasil. It seems to me that Yasha goes around planting these seeds and the arbor is but one of many, though the resulting blessings seem to be slightly different. Speaking of wing weavers, there is an account of Sanctus Medicus injecting the bone marrow of wing weavers into Xianzhu immortals, specifically someone with altered flesh. After six hours, the patient gains the characteristics of wing weavers, becoming light as the wind and growing a pair of wings that allow them to fly. This is a very ancient prescription from the Theophany era, but I imagine it inspired the experiments of the previous head of the Alchemy Commission, Dan Chu's predecessor and Bai Lu's teacher, Yun Hua. See, bone marrow contains stem cells, so injecting certain stem cells into someone would alter the balance of their cells and allow some interaction with Yang Shu's immortality and Mara. Yun Hua was a Vidyara, we know this because she turned into a Mirage Echo, and she's the one who was researching replenishing the Vidyara population. She claims that Dan Feng enlightened her with his changes to the transmutation arcanum that created the draconic abomination, which was a new life. She tells us that Bai Lu was a breakthrough in her research. She claims her understanding of reproduction was limited by ordinary notions and brings up the idea of incorporating other races into the flesh of the dragon. Dan Hung interprets this as the transmutation arcanum being some way for the Vidyata to return to normal reproduction, but he has misunderstood her. To understand what she was doing, we can examine some of her experiments. Her experiments are mostly documented in the Sanctus Medicus Devil's criminal evidence records. Yun Hua's brilliant idea was to test the injection of the blood and bone marrow of Vidyada into other species and more or less see what happened. The first subject listed was a bony fish. It molted its scales and grew a cuticle on its head with secondary bone development. Its mouth region was also enlarged and it grew hair around its dorsal fin and gills. So, the fish started turning into a dragon, which is most likely a reference to the Chinese story about a carp that jumped over a waterfall and turned into a dragon. The second subject was a dog that showed signs of mania and shed its nails and teeth. They grew back sharper the following day and the dog developed keratosis on its neck and tail. 
it was destroyed after attacking and wounding two alchemists. The third subject was a berry pheasant that shed its feathers and symbiotic berries. Its torso was stretched and elongated and its head acquired characteristics resembling other creatures. It grew another limb from its chest and was terminated. The fourth subject was a yellow boulder oxen which we know from the Codex of Apocrypha is a kind of horned cattle with a short tail, lustrous fur and a stony texture. Two days after injection, its skin started to resemble scales, joint reflexes were observed, a sarcoma developed on its forehead, which is a kind of cancer, and its horns and hooves experienced accelerated growth. It too was terminated. Naturally, Yunhua's experiments did not stop at the local animals. The next subject is a long-life Xianjiu human that was already showing signs of becoming Mara-struck. The injection did not stop the Mara, but once fully Mara-struck, they did retain remarkable clarity comparable to that of a normal person. It seems that because the subject refused something, they may have eliminated them. The next subject was a short-life outwelder whose cellular activity was activated, resulting in significant improvements in bodily functions. Their body was revitalized and they experienced no adverse reactions except for localized scaling of the skin. They eventually started de-aging until they became a child and then even further until they were liquefied, much like what happened to Scholar Benini after he stole some embryonic fluid of a Vidyata egg and used it on himself. The last subject mentioned in this document is another short life species of an unknown race. They were already dead when they were delivered but experienced revitalizing effects, including profuse hair growth and skin molting. They even started growing horn-like cuticula on the head. They did not properly revive, but Yunhua notes that the bone marrow was so mighty even in the body of a deceased person. One thing to note is that we don't currently know what happens if a foxian or borosin is injected with vidyado bone marrow, but we can assume it would be similar to the long-life injections that suppress Mara or the injections on the dog that made it a bit rabid. It's only injection on short-life species without blessings from Yaoshu that we see dragon-like symptoms such as horns and scaling. And apparently you must not inject a Vidyado bone marrow into one of long scions, though we don't know what happens if you do. This leads us to the topic of the Draft of Draconic Surge, as described by Dan Shu in the Sanctus Medicus Story Quests. This prescription utilizes live vidyardo bone marrow as an injection with other ingredients that are supposed to maintain and reanimate the stem cells in the bone marrow, allowing it to function in the host after injection. Dan Shu tells us that in long life species, this bone marrow injection triggers Mara in a more controlled fashion under the dragon's guidance. They are then able to be Mara struck while retaining sanity, just like the Mara struck person in Yunhua's experiment. In a short life, however, we learn that vidyardo bone marrow grafts the power of the dragons into their body causing the rapid elevation of bodily capacities for a short duration and significantly improving the short life species' fragile physiologies. However, once the stem cells have perished the host's immune system, the host suffers a catastrophic regression. This is the basis of the Dragonheart theory about Blade, basically that perfect immortality is the combination of both Yaosha and Long, since it's extremely unlikely that a mere emanator like Shihu alone can create someone like Blade he likely has a combination of Shuhu's gift generating Mara-like symptoms and some unending source of stabilizing Vidyardo stem cells, such as the dragon heart, working in sync to maintain perfect, indestructible immortality. This would also be giving him permanent superhuman strengths that he did not have before. This theory is extra likely as we do know that Blade also experienced some age regression too, but we don't know yet the exact reason why he did not get turned into a puddle of liquid. I would guess that Shuhu's gift is playing a role in preventing that outcome. Fun fact, there's a record in the Disciples' Diary of a Xianzhou Long Life Cloud Knight that could not beat the Vidyador in their duels. He was recommended Draft of Draconic Surge and equated it to feeling like his organs were being boiled alive, very similar to Jing Liu's description of her core S boiling in the presence of Rahu. This soldier is implied to have killed his rival as this egg describes a brilliant cloud knight that is suddenly killed with a spear during a sparring match. Perhaps the same surge in power is the reason that Blade was able to leave Jing Liu barely holding herself together after the duel where she kills him for the first time. As a mere craftsman, he had absolutely no business being able to severely injure the sword champion of the Lofu. Alright, now it's time to talk about what we know of Vidyada horns and tails. From what I can tell, the lore here is inconsistent so far. We're told that only High Elders have horns, but Yunhua was experimenting with growing horns on other species, 
We also see Preceptor Tauran with horns, and he's not a High Elder. Bailu was not born with horns, hers grew in later, which is consistent with this water mirage of a High Elder child not having horns, but we see Dan Hung with horns in the egg in his Adalon 6 and Tale of a Vidyadara. One might assume it's just because his rebirth was botched and he kept his power, but there's this in-game mural of a Vidyadara inside an egg with horns and a tail too. Much does note that this mural looks new, so it might be part of some misinformation campaign by the preceptors, but I can't fathom why they would do this, so I'm confused. Either way, we don't know for sure who or what should have horns, but we do know for certain that is not only an indication of high elder power, and can be given to other people, including other races. In terms of tails, Bailu is an anomaly as far as we can tell. She asked Dunhung why he does not have a tail, but as far as we can tell, Yubia did not have a tail either, and neither did Dunfung. Neither does Preceptor Tauron or any other Vidyado we have seen so far. I think there is a real possibility that her tail is one of those extra growths that some of the specimens were getting as a result of the bone marrow injections. We're told by an NPC from the Alchemy Commission that Bailu was selected by Dunfung to be his successor. This is simply not possible because we know from his point of view that Dunfung remained silent after his arrest. He never said anything to anyone when they came to visit him, not even Jing Yuan. So just with that information, we know that the claim is a lie. And it's fairly obvious why they lie. All activities performed by Sanctus Medicus in their investigations of Yao Shi's gifts are strictly illegal on the Xianjiao. When a mysterious, never-before-seen, new High Elder lineage suddenly appears aboard the Lofu, the easiest thing for them to do is to blame the late Dan Fang, whose current incarnation, as far as they're aware, remembers absolutely nothing and won't be able to deny their claims. Jing Yuan has always been suspicious of the Alchemy Commission for a long time and regularly takes the opportunity to meet Bai Lu, likely monitoring her progress and circumstances, waiting for the truth of her creation to be revealed. Meanwhile, we also know that Sanctus Medicus was trying to assassinate him, but undercover dogs, aka Jing Yuan's spies, kept interfering with their plans. Bai Lu believes she has no destructive powers, but we're told in her character story that, according to Yun Yu, her attendant, she has demonstrated her abilities of calling lightning and commanding the waters. Yun Yu instructed a craftsman to create the dragon horn pillory to shackle her tail and prevent a loss of control over her powers and a repeat of the disaster of the sedition of Mbappé de Luné. This shackle is likely the real reason that she doesn't have destructive powers. She doesn't know the truth because they told her that it was a High Elder decoration. This lie is also likely the reason that she expected Dan Hung to have a tail, even though as far as we know, the Imbibed Lune line never had a permanent tail like she does. There's also the matter of her dreams. Her previous maid, Yuan Li, reveals that every maid was told to record by Lu's dreams and daily activities. She felt that it was for some malevolent purpose and stopped doing it and Bai Lu reassured her that she never told anyone about her dreams. This is why Bai Lu tells us that she doesn't dream. Then on the express, she reveals after her first visit she started having dreams about travel and flying up high. Some have taken this to mean that she is dreaming about Bai Hung, who was a star skiff pilot, but we know that actually Bai Hung, despite being part of a family of nameless, never visited the express, so there shouldn't be any correlation there. There's no reason that the Express would trigger memories of Bai Hung that simply being on the Xianzhou wouldn't, considering Bai Hung lived on the Xianzhou. On the topic of Bai Lu's dreams, I think there's a good chance that, as part of the Bloomborn Stion experiments, she was subject to something called an injection of past life dreams. It needs to be injected within five years of a hatching rebirth and gives an unpredictable number of past life dreams. It says that it's not to be used except when the very survival of the Vidyada race is at risk. I think it is likely that she was injected with this and then was monitored for efficacy in the hopes that she would miraculously dream about the secrets of the transmutation arcanum. Obviously, nothing special happened in that regard. Remember that Dunfang never gave up the secrets of the transmutation arcanum and Tauran, the preceptor with the mysterious horns that visited the chain Dunfang, considered it their responsibility to confiscate the transmutation arcanum and the orb of abysm from Dan Feng to uphold the continuation of the Ica lines, but they never got it. Consequently, they had to try their best with the limited resources available when creating Bai Lu. I think the goal of the individuals who participated in the creation of Bai Lu is different for each party. 
I think that the preceptors that smuggled the arbor roots into the Alchemy Commission were probably the same that Wanna Dunfung released to seal the arbor. They are the ones who would be desperately seeking a replacement High Elder, and it's likely these Vidyadra that were trying to assassinate Bailu once the stronger candidate of Dunhung returned. Yunhua tells us that her concern was solving the Vidyata reproduction issue and that she believed Dan Feng was concerned about the same thing, which, by the way, is most likely not the case, as Dan Feng seems to primarily express concern about the arbor causing repeated attacks from the denizens of abundance. In my opinion, his goal seems to be preventing further deaths in the future, but I'll talk more about the sedition in the second video. I think Don Shu's motivation was to continue experimenting on perfecting Yasha's immortality, which can only be achieved with access to the Arba, to the Vidyadara, and of course, access to live Vidyadara bone marrow samples. Gochan, who represents the Vidyadara cooperating with Don Shu specifically, was also most likely the Vidyadara responsible for going underwater and planting the Stellaron in the Arba, for Don Shu's plans with Fantilia, or at least one of his allies or servants may have been. The Vidyata obviously can't all be lumped under one united faction, but it's easy to see how the different agendas would ultimately result in the creation of Bailu. In terms of Bailu's power, she has something that she calls a Draconic Ica. The term Ica is used a few times, such as in the Ica of Two Dragons cinematics, and seems to refer to the bloodline of a High Elder, supported by her talent called Vidyata Ica lines. In Bailu's case, her Draconic Ica appears to be the water stored in the gourd that she uses during her abilities. In her case, she uses it to heal visceral lesions in her character story, so it doesn't refer literally to her genetics. It should be noted that the waters of the Scale Gorge are known to have medicinal properties, such as the case of the Elixir Crucibles. It drinks the water of the ancient sea like a whale swallows the tide and refines it into medicinal pellets. Bai Lu also tells us that the water of a water mirage can be used as medicine too. So it appears that Bailu's Draconic Ica is most likely the same water that she holds in a magical gourd. One extra fun thing to note here is the curious naming of her Eidolon Ambrosial Aqua. You know, like the Ambrosial Arbor. Another subtle hint at her being the Bloomborn Scion. Very clever, Hoyo. One thing of particular interest is how when she is helping Dunhung seal the Ambrosial Arbor, it zooms in on her gourd for a moment when she starts casting implying her ceiling power is coming from within the gourd, similar to how it zooms in on Dunhung's orb. This is a good time to mention that there's a decent chance that the secret of the High Elder is a scientific one, as Todd's documents claim that the seal of the arbor is an advanced technology that's kept secret, further supported by the discovery that the core S branches are bionic material and not real plant matter. It fits the sci-fi theme that none of it would be actual magic and simply seems like it is. Maybe there's a certain biologist interested in reproducing permanence and investigating the arbor who might have figured it out. But I'm going to delve more into that in the next video, where I talk more about what I think happened during this edition of Imbiber de Lune, the half draconic abomination, Jing Liu, Shu Hu, and more. Please let me know in the comments what your thoughts are at this point. Do you still believe that Bai Lu was created by Dan Feng and Ying Xing as a reincarnated Bai Hung? Or do you agree with me that she is the miracle bloomborn scion created by Sanctus Medicus and some of the Vidyado preceptors that are blaming Dan Feng to hide their crimes? I'm very excited to hear your thoughts and I hope everyone can have constructive conversations in the comments about this. Hopefully I can create the next video within the next two weeks, but I'll provide updates on my Twitter if that changes. Until then, see you guys next time.